Yeah, so in addition to what Jenny said, I actually uh, operate a small cheese making business with my wife, Rachel, and we're uh, doing that seasonally. So we only make our cheese when the cows from a neighboring farm are on pasture. And in our neck of the woods, that means it's somewhere between late April and a good year and uh, early November. And in a, a year with uh, more challenging weather conditions, because here it can get rather wet in the spring, we may not be able to start till middle of May, which was like last year. And then uh, depending on when the snow comes and when the pastures begin to fail, it could be even in the middle of October. But, uh, you know, typically it's six months on, six months off. And the title of my presentation for you all tonight is Blue Cheeses with Natural Rinds. Um, we make two blue cheeses here at Parish Hill Creamery. That's the name of our cheese making business. Everything we make is made from raw milk. And we have a very traditional approach, uh, what you would actually call natural cheese making. We make our own starter cultures. And uh, even in the case of one of the cheeses we make, we prepare the rennet ourselves. The salt that we use in all of our cheeses comes from a local salt works in Maine on the seacoast. Um, so we're trying to replicate somewhat what cheeses might have tasted like 100 years ago in this area. Although blue cheese wasn't made here, um, they were making a lot of cheddar cheese. And I just wanted to say before to premise this presentation that blue cheese has been the most challenging type of cheese for me to make in my long career. I just find it very interesting and um, there's a lot to it. So what I wanna do tonight is I wanna go through several key points about making blue cheese with natural rinds. So I'm not gonna be talking about blues that are going to be wrapped in foil or vacuum sealed or waxed. These are cheeses that would age on wooden shelves in my case, just like my other cheeses. So I'm going to start out by introducing some varieties. Then I'll move on to what the characteristics of milk are that are suitable for blue cheese making. Then in the third phase of the presentation, I will go over the chemistry of blues focusing on the acidity, the moisture level, and the salt level in these cheeses to make them turn out in the best quality. I'll move on to technology, how the cheeses are made, and then into salting, different ways that cheese, the blue cheeses can be salted. And um, we'll end up with the aging process, which includes the needling to introduce the air into the blue cheese. And finally, uh, a bit about the kind of environmental conditions that we would need to get the best result for aging our blue with a natural rind. And I think I will squeeze that into an hour uh, easily with your questions. So I'm going to try to do that in about 45 minutes. Um, and then we'll have time for questions. And if the questions fall short, I have a few extra slides and information about defects that you guys will be getting in your PDF but I just don't know if we'll, I'll get to that tonight. So let me get through these first key points about the blue. There is a wide variety of blue cheeses. I've, I've taken a stab at making many of them in the classes here. The Limeswold is an obscure blue that's kind of like a camembert cheese with blue veining inside. So that's what you would call your soft ripened and uh, lactic style blue cheese. In the middle is a, a blue that we make is pretty uh, close to the French type blues that they call the forms. And it is called Jack's blue. It's a kind of a classic shape. It's a little taller than it is wide. And it has a fair amount of blue veining. Of course, that varies depending on, uh, on uh, what you're doing in the vat mostly. And finally, on the right hand side, we make a cheese called West West blue. And here I'm taking a stab at reproducing the farmhouse gorgonzola. So like the original way gorgonzola was made on the farms in Italy before it became made in factories on a larger scale. And they would uh, make this big wheel. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty good sized wheel of blue, probably the biggest there is out there. And they would make this from combining the evening uh, milk turned into curds that would sit overnight 
with the next day's morning milk made into curds. So those two curds would be combined together to make a wheel. And that's the way we make the West West Blue. And to me, and, uh, and also have, after having talked with many other blue cheese makers, it seems to be the most challenging blue that you could possibly try to create. So let's start out with the soft ripened blues, these lactic style um, blues. We have you know, like the classic kinds that have the white mold rind, like a, a bloomy rind type cheese with blue veining. Then there's some other ones that, that uh, actually have external blue, like this, the picture here is of uh, Monte, Monte Enebro, a, a newer blue coming out of Spain. But here in New England, where I'm from, uh, in Massachusetts, which is our neighbor, a company called Westfield Farm, which started in the late 70s, they created a, a very interesting blue uh, that is uh, actually the predecessor of Monte Enebro called Hubbardston Blue. So here we can see that the, the uh, idea is to create a mixed kind of rind. We don't really care if blue mold gets on the rind. We're not trying to produce a pure bloomy type white mold rind. And finally, we have a rhinoless soft ripe and blues, but that is a topic for another presentation. Let's move on to the, uh, what I call the mixed type blue, which is your tome style. Uh, and uh, here, there are many blues that have been made according to this uh, sort of old French approach to making blue. They are, variable in sometimes they're a little wider than they are tall, sometimes they're a little taller than they are wide. The classic form shape is taller than it's wide or about the same dimensionally. Um, and I've put some examples up here on this slide for you to uh, familiarize yourself with. They're all top notch, high quality blues that, uh, that I can get, of course, uh, here in the US. So. I would think that you guys would be able to get some of these French ones, perhaps. Of course, we all know Roquefort, but that is a rhineless type blue, although it has a similar type shape as these ones. And the uh, interesting thing about, uh, about this shape and this sort of French uh, style blue is that there is a more modern uh, form style called the Blue d'Auvergne, which you might be able to get, which is often made from pasteurized milk. And that uh, comes out of, in the Auvergne, the Auvergnats, the people live there, they love the Roquefort cheese, which was in, you know, pretty close to where they live. They could get the Roquefort, the sheep milk blue. And they loved it so much that they uh, were so disappointed when, uh, when you know, the time of year would come around where the, because um, it was a seasonally made cheese back in the day, that they wouldn't be able to get anymore. So they created their own cow milk version of, the Roquefort, and that is what's known as the Blue d'Auvergne. And it's made in two sizes. One is the like five pounder uh, or like two, three kilo, and the other is only a, a 250 gram size. So you might want to look out for that one too. Then we can, we can finish off with our little overview of blue cheese uh, styles with the uh, milled curd type blues. And these are, we uh, are, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Stilton, um, but there are also blues made in other parts of the world, like Italy and in the French Alps, that all come from this original kind of, and even here in the US in uh, Wisconsin, come, come uh, from this sort of ancient Celtic way of making cheese. And I think there, there's a school of thought right now that, that even though these are geographically separated, uh, when you're looking at Stilton and Blue de Terminol and Castelmagno um, and Gorgonzola, they're separated pretty far geographically. They go back in time about to about the same period. And the idea is that the Celtic people were making cheese uh, of that style and they, it just persisted through this day in these isolated sort of mountainous areas of Europe. And of course, the uh, um, England, you had that same sort of historical uh, bent to the um, food production. We're skipping right over the rhymeless blues. Like I said, we'll do that in another presentation. But right there is one of your Australian ones that I love 
particularly the Roaring Forties Blue. We can think about double cream blues as well. This would be uh, fortified milk, adding extra cream to it to up the fat content. And as we'll find out here in, a, in a, just a short while, high fat milk makes very good tasting blue cheeses. Um, you not only get the zippy uh, flavor coming through from the blue mold breaking down the fat, but if you have a lot of fat in the milk, then you get the richness of, as well, and the cheese isn't quite as sharp. So that's something that people have been doing for a while. We see in France, in Germany, Denmark, Wisconsin, and Indiana. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that is popular, I will just point out, and you might want to take a stab at it. So like upping your fat content to say 6% fat in the milk by adding cream, and then following a blue cheese recipe uh, may get you there. Many different milks are used for blues, um, even water buffalo milk in Italy. There's some uh, rise of blue made from that kind of milk. Sheep milk is, is excellent because it's got a high fat content and both sheep and goat milk, when the fat begins to break down, gives an exceptionally spicy, uh, zippy flavor to the uh, cheese. Whereas the cow milk cheeses are, tend to be a little more uh, mild and uh, they all get very complex though as they get advanced in age. Um, oftentimes milk gets blended to make cheese and there's no reason why you couldn't do that in the case of blue. What is really important to think about though is this ratio of protein to fat in the milk. You know, how you're starting out uh, with milk is really important to the actual quality of the cheese, how hard, how soft it's gonna be. And because blue cheeses really hinge, a good quality blue hinges on it being soft enough so that that blue mold can get going inside the cheese. It has to retain moisture in order for it to work out well. One of the defects that can occur is lack of blue. And it may be just the fact that the cheese got too dry. There wasn't enough fat in the milk. So, if we divide the protein in the milk by the fat and make a ratio, we're, we're trying to go for something less than 0.8. So we want a higher fat milk relative to protein. Um, late season milk can present problems for some cheeses uh, in, in terms of the quality, like hard Alpine style cheeses, even cheddar cheeses, because of this extra fat that's, that's in the uh, milk and it's hard to get the whey to drain out. Blue cheese, not so much they may even benefit from being made in late season. Uh, and here I'm talking about late lactation. So if you're a seasonal dairy farm and you have uh, your milk in the last couple months, uh, it's beginning to change. So that ratio of protein to fat is really diving down and you can uh, uh, often benefit from making your blue cheese during the, the late part of the lactation. But, as in all cheese making, we want to try to keep the quality of the cheese consistent unless we can market it otherwise. I mean, it's possible to have a discussion with the buyers and then they with their customers to explain why, you know, in this case, our blue cheese is a little firmer in the summer and a little softer in the fall. However, we don't want it to get too far uh, in, in a, um, away from having a standard. And so here we want, you know, to be happy with a certain ratio of protein to fat in the milk. We're making a good cheese. We want to try to keep around that ratio as much as possible. Um, if we depart from that and get too high or too low, it can, it can cause these kinds of problems where our coagulation time changes and the way, the, the ability of way to drain out of the curd either goes faster or slower. And that's going to ultimately affect how many curd openings we have in the interior of the cheese, how well the blue mold grows, and then ultimately how it ripens, breaks down to a softer texture and delicious flavor. So moving on here from milk, uh, we will go into the uh, actual technology, the way blues are made. But a little more about milk. So if we're going to compare raw milk cheese making to pasteurized milk cheese making. Raw milk 
contains natural milk lipases, and they're going to break down that fat, and they're going to contribute to not only a stronger flavor uh, in the same amount of time, if we compare it to a pasteurized milk cheese, it, in flavor development, we're going to get a stronger flavor in the same amount of time, but more complex, because we've got this kind of lipase that um, is from raw milk itself, and it uh, is going to do its thing uh, in, in a natural system. Whereas when we're pasteurizing milk, we have to add the lipase in at a certain level to get that same effect. It's gonna probably be a small amount in this case, but nevertheless, that would be something to think about doing in the case of making a blue cheese. Uh, yes, blue cheese itself uh, has the blue mold in it, and the blue mold has strong lipase enzymes as well, so it's going to do its thing. Um, and you may not even wanna mess around with it by adding a lipase to the milk. Uh, you just have to, something you could potentially experiment with. So um, I just wanted to point that out because I have toyed around with lipase many times in making cheese and uh, noticed that it has a, a dramatic effect if you add enough. So I've learned, you know, over the years how to add a smidgen, see what happens, maybe add a little more the next time and, and on and on to get the best flavor development. Uh, now, the breakdown of fat can start actually uh, physically just by the way we handle the milk. So if we're pouring milk, say, out of a can into our vat and we just dump it from a, a, a height of, you know, a meter or maybe, maybe not that much, 80 centimeters above the bottom of the vat and the milk just free falls into it or it comes out of a pipe filling the vat and, you know, splatters into the bottom. Um, then uh, we're going to start activating lipase right away because the, some of the fat globules are going to be sheared. Their, their uh, membranes are going to be broken up and the lipase enzymes will be able to start attacking the fat and breaking it down into fatty acids. Raw milk cheese making can be very tricky in terms of making blue cheese because we have these wild geotrichum yeasts in raw milk in, in a very good amount. And oftentimes, and I've seen this in my own blues, we'll get discoloration inside the blue, not, not the brown type, but more like uh, pinks, yellows, things like that, a little bit of a reddish. And these are these wild colorful yeasts that uh, some of them are strains of geotrichum that can be expressing themselves. They don't like salt. So one thing that we can do to ensure that we don't, that we get a more pure growth of blue mold in our cheese is to get the salt content adequate. It's also possible to, uh, to use milk that's being produced from fermented feeds. We don't have to worry so much about uh, getting milk just from pastures when we're making blue. That, that is because the bugs that are in fermented feeds that can produce lots of gas are, are harnessed to some extent by the actual chemistry of the blue cheese. The blue cheese is acid enough, it has enough salt, and they're typically aged at low enough temperatures below 10 degrees centigrade that the uh, butyric type bacteria or the propionic type bacteria that can be in fermented feeds will not grow so well. And um, even a little bit of gas is not a bad thing in a blue cheese. It helps keep the, the curds opened up so that the blue mold can grow within those air pockets. So let's, let me dive into the chemistry right here of the blue cheese. The first of the three uh, cornerstones of, of good cheese making is acidification. And so we want to get a good amount of acid in the blue, anywhere from like a pH of 4.5 to 5.0. And we're pretty happy about the, the cheese when it's young. Um, the texture is going to be a bit brittle because of the nature of the, uh, of its, the acid nature, but also it makes curds that don't compact so well. So that's good because we want to open textured cheese. And we really want to focus in on that when we're working in the vat. 
is when the blue cheese uh, curds are not acidic enough, we're going to get too much compaction and we're probably not going to get the kind of texture that we, we want to make really good cheese. And right here, I, I put down some typical pHs of, uh, of these three different uh, families of blue. I've broken it down into the lactic type with uh, the higher acidity, the mixed type, which are those French forms, uh, including Roquefort. And, uh, and those are in the middle pH area. And then we have the rennet type, which are the cheddar types, and the gorgonzola, the millet curd ones, which are a bit higher. And blue cheese loves to grow right around pH 5. 5.05 is its ideal. So in the case of the lactic character ones, the pH will buffer up a bit when the cheese is young. And by the time the, the blue begins to grow, it'll be right about in the perfect zone. And in terms of the rennet type, we just have to uh, uh, focus in that much harder to make sure we have enough open texture in the cheese so that the blue will grow and keep the salt level high enough. Moisture content, the second of the three pillars, I should have said, the three pillars of making great cheese. Uh, we, uh, again, I'm gonna harken back to what I was talking about, the milk protein fat ratio. And if our ratio is, is, uh, is lower, it's gonna really help us because the, the extra fat in the milk is gonna help retain whey. It'll prevent too much moisture loss when we're making the cheese in the vat. We're trying to hit a target of about 43%. So that's, you know, moderately high, uh, but it's, it's way above cheddar. It's like four or five percentages above cheddar. Um, if the cheeses get too high in moisture, here we go. They, they may have a distorted shape. You'll get weird fermentations because there's extra whey in there that, you know, you really want it to drain out. And in spots, you can have over acidification and you can have fountains forming where, where liquid is seeping out through the rind and things like that. So we, we really have to focus in on the moisture, try to nail it at that 43% for most of our blues. And the final pillar, salt. And here we have to think about salt as not just dry salt or a brine bath of salt. We're thinking about the salt inside the cheese. What is that? It's actually brine. The water of a cheese is a brine. It's not one and a half percent salt. That's the dry salt percentage in the cheese. Here we actually are striving for uh, a brine concentration uh, uh, value. And so we, we're not really gonna go out and test that, but it's good to just visualize this, that. Um, I'm looking at a cheese under the microscope, and what I've got is some free water and the bacteria are moving around in that, the other microbes. And uh, then I've got the bound water to the protein, and, and this free water is in a state of about 6 to 10% brine. So um, it's, uh, it's pretty salty in there, and that's good for blue cheese because it helps to uh, get a pure growth of blue mold, and it um, prevents the... Uh, um, contaminating type microorganisms from growing very well because none of them are really very salt hardy, especially the geotrichum that I alluded to earlier. So let's now uh, take a look at the uh, technical aspects of making the cheeses. And we'll again, I'll go through the three families I've, I've divided blues up into, just again, hinting at the incredible variety of blue cheeses there are. Essentially, blue cheese is just any kind of cheese that you can get blue mold to grow inside. So here we've got the uh, young Limeswolds uh, in my cave that, that I make in classes here. And uh, they look a lot like a camembert. You know, they weigh uh, 250 grams. Maybe they're a little thicker. They might weigh 300, 350. But nevertheless, they're made in camembert forms. And... Uh, so you can see here the cheese is probably around a week old or so and the blue mold is beginning to grow on the outside. Um, and eventually that will uh, be taken over by uh, white mold as I've sprayed those cheeses with the white mold. The cultures that we, um, 
we typically use to make these higher acid type blues are actually I made a mistake. These uh, these cheeses are um, past the point where the white mold would have grown in. So this is something else I'm experimenting with. What you would see here if this was lime's mold is you'd see this bloomy rind, and you'd see some needle holes in the uh, um, the outside through the rind and. And at this stage, you know, being about a week to 10 days old, that white mold would be covering the cheese. Um, and then when the cheese is around 30, 40 days, if we cut it in half, you would see some blue uh, veining inside like you saw in the first slide of the presentation. So here we have cultures that are more mesophilic. Um, we've got uh, an acid producing culture, the Lactococcus lactis and Lactococcus cremorus. And we also are gonna supplement with the uh, aroma cultures that are mesophilic. These cultures all grow well at the uh, typical temperature that we make blue at, 86 to 88. Um, and even uh, you know, in the make room, we're keeping it around 70, 75 degrees. So the cultures are gonna be active enough, they're gonna make acidity, and that's what we want. We can also add a, a yeast called Cluveromyces lactis to the milk, and that will help produce CO2 as well. In addition to the, the aromatype cultures of the Lactococcus diacetylactis and Leuconostra cremorus, we can get this yeast culture in there too to help uh, with the CO2 production. And its secondary effect is to help deacidify the paste so that that pH will go up a little bit. So like I said earlier, we get to pH 5.05, which is the optimum pH for blue mold to grow. And uh, this, this uh, yeast culture is, is used uh, in blue cheese making. I've used it myself, I found it to be very effective. So um, we're going to add our blue mold culture to the vat as well. And we're gonna choose that depending on what kind of flavor profile that uh, we want. And it's a lot easier to pick these blue mold cultures when you're working with pasteurized milk. You really know what's going to happen. You've got a level playing field. In fact, you've got a, a, a blank canvas to, to paint on as a cheesemaker. Whereas if you're making uh, blue from raw milk, I don't, I have, I am pretty much uh, decided at this point that through the trials I've done with about five different blue mold cultures in my, my blue cheese here at Parashill, that there is not all that much difference between their effect. Uh, the real flavor in the blue is coming through from the milk and less so from the choice of blue mold. But remember, if you've got that clean canvas and uh, with the pasteurized milk, it's really important to select the type of mold you want for the cheese you wanna make. And they, there's a wide variety. There's probably eight different ones that, that I know I could get at this point. Um, so uh, anyways, let's go and take a look at the next group, the mixed, the, the uh, form type blues that have that higher pH closer to five. Here, we're gonna still be using the four mesophilic bacteria in our starter cultures. Um, however, in uh, French cheese making, they love to, to make these cocktails of cultures where they're using a little bit of yogurt, perhaps in the raw milk or in pasteurized milk, they're using the mesophilic cultures with Streptococcus thermophilus type culture to produce acid as well. Here you can have a little bit higher temperature, even go up to 92 degrees. Uh, if you're working with really high fat milk, you may want to have a little bit higher temperature to help drain uh, more way out of the curds, for example. But at any rate, you can um, stimulate the growth of the Streptococcus thermophilus uh, by having a bit higher of a temperature. But because it's in place, it's going to uh, slow down. It's not even gonna grow all that fast at 88 to 92. And it's gonna slow down once the, the, the curds get hooped and they're draining on the table, uh, it'll slow down. And so, by having this cocktail type uh, approach to, uh, to making the blue cheese with, with mixed mesophilic and thermophilic cultures, you're going to end up with a higher pH. That's a really good strategy to uh, keep the pH a bit higher than in the 
the lactic type blues. Finally, we have our rennet character blues. And here, we're, uh, we're not only going to have the mixed culture approach with uh, the thermophilus, but we're going to add in Lactobacillus bulgaricus in the case of making gorgonzola, because now we're, we're traveling over to Italy, where they're using a lot of that kind of uh, yogurty type culture to make cheeses. And that's just the classic Italian approach is to use the um, yogurt along with the raw milk. And in this case, if we're using pasteurized milk, we're going to be using a blend of, of all these six bacteria to get that result. And we're gonna be working at a higher temperature again, uh, uh, a little bit higher than the mixed character blues. And that's in order to invigorate the um, thermophilic cultures. So here we go. Some of the main points about making blue cheese when we're working in the vat. So uh, we're not just going to wait 15, 30 minutes between when we add the starter and when we add the rennet. Um, we need to get a longer ripening time no matter what we're making here. Uh, I really believe that because there's no elevating the temperature, um, to invigorate thermophilic cultures and mesophilic cultures are, are slower in producing acid. Um, because of those two things, well, we reflect back on what I just went through about the culture systems and thinking about those two things. We wanna give the bacteria enough time to uh, get going, get happy in the milk before we add the red in it and coagulate it and then move on to cutting the curd and you know, stirring the curds in the whey, and then eventually drain the whey off the curds. This longer contact time when there's a lot of water, the water activity is very high in the system, will help them to grow, consume the lactose, and produce lactic acid, which is what we want. Um, we're going to wait till the pH drops down lower than a lot of the other cheeses we make. So we're going to get down to about 6.4, and that really helps uh, the the um, rennet coagulation stimulates rennet activity to have a little bit lower pH so we can get a, uh, um, a nice firm curd which helps to uh, retain uh, enough moisture to hit that 43% moisture to make the classic blue. We're going to employ uh, coagulation times anywhere from 50 to 90 minutes. The more lactic character we want in the cheese, the longer we're going to have for a ripening time and a coagulation time. The less lect character, going back to the milled curd, the rennet types, we're gonna go on the shorter side. So that's why we get this range uh, in both cases. And, and here we go again, we want that firm curd to, to make sure we get enough water binding and get the appropriate moisture for the cheese. We wanna cut the curds not too small because we don't, again, wanna make the cheese too hard. And we wanna, uh, it really depends, Jeremy. Like you know, you've already seen what a wide variety of blues we have. Anywhere from very soft ripens or making cheese like a camembert, all the way up to something that's that's um, getting a little more uh, on the lines of a, a soft cheddar. So at any rate, we uh, we're going to not want to have the curds cut too small. Some of the recipes have, uh, have a pre-draining of the whey, and that's when your acidity is running well, and, and you're like, okay, the pH is great, it's, it's low enough, I'm ready to um, drain the whey off and hoop, and you know, stir the curds around the vat and then get them in the hoops. Um, and, and however you're saying to yourself as you're working at the vat, oh, these curds aren't quite firm enough, um, you can really help right at that point when your acidity is running a little ahead of your curd firming, to drain off some of the whey, 10, 15%, and then stir again quickly for five, 10 minutes, and that'll help the curds uh, bounce against each other more and firm them up, help expel more whey. Just to, to go back there, okay. Before I leave this, we do want uh, to make sure that um, in the case of, uh, of, of most blue cheese, cheese making that isn't 
very soft, ripened, like the lactic styles. We're talking about the mixed character and the rennet types. We're really looking at curds that, um, that have a pretty good balance. So the typical way of making blue cheese uh, in the vat is to drain off almost all the way, or if not all the way, and then work the curds a bit by breaking them up by hand and then getting more way to come out before we put them in the hoops. Because if we put them in the hoops when they're still too, uh, are very wet, they may compact again, and then we won't get the, those openings between the curds that we want later on to have the blue mold grow into. Now for salt. So um, sometimes uh, in blue cheese recipes, uh, you'll see that they're adding salt right in uh, to the vat with the whey and the curds. And this is after a pre-drain of about 40%. Uh, well, you would calculate how much weight, whey to drain off. You would, you would consider that to be equal to 40% of the milk volume to start with. So say you had, you know, a thousand liters of milk to start, and now you're at this point, you're going to drain off 400 liters of whey. You're going to uh, add in the salt, 0.6% of that thousand liters. So what is that? That's, uh, that's six kilos of salt. You're gonna toss that into the curds and whey as you're stirring them. After you drain off, off the 40% of the, the, the 400 liters of whey. And then you're, that's going to help um, in a couple of ways. It's gonna help make the curds more buoyant and they won't have a tendency to mat, stick together so much. So you get more openings. There'll be uh, firmer curds with less distortion. Uh, as they uh, they hit their the hoops and begin to drain, and also you you start out with the benefit of having some salt in the cheese. So at one day old, it's already 0.6 to 0.8 percent salt. Which if we look at that brine concentration again, we're probably up to like three percent brine. So that's going to inhibit things like geotrichum yeast and other contaminants that uh, that may be causing problems with discoloration. And uh, this is a, and a very effective way to uh, overcome that. Not everybody does it this way, but it's certainly something to think about. So moving on with the process, draining uh, the, the uh, way off of the curds, that's gonna be at about pH six on the average. So somewhere in that range, five, nine to six, two. And this is to create this more Demineralized, demineralized curd with less buffering so that the pH can continue to drop pretty quickly during the afternoon of draining. Um, and oh, yeah, so I was talking about this earlier, you know, with the soft ripened cheeses, we're, we're not working the curds so much because we don't want to lose too much moisture. But for the semi-hard cheeses, the, the forms, the, the mixed and the rennet character blues, we're draining all the uh, way off and then we're sometimes working those curds to get even more way out before they're hooped. And this is gonna be uh, um, really good for the texture of the cheese. Um, we wanna hoop the curds quickly because if we take our time and we get the warm curds in, half of the you know, wheel has warm curds and the, the top half is colder curds because we've been sort of lollygagging, uh, it could create problems with une uneven moisture distribution in the cheeses and uneven bluing. So uh, special techniques here for, uh, for like your, your Stilton type cheese, your Gorgonzola, and for uh, people that actually turn cheddar cheeses into blue, um, we're actually gonna go through the cheddaring process and we're gonna be salting the curds directly before uh, they uh, are after they're milled. And this is great because uh, we can overcome the, again, these problems with contaminants if we get that salt in even quicker. Surface salting, you know, the oldest form of salting and uh, we do this here with our blues and it makes it a lot trickier and more challenging to produce a, a really good quality blue because it, uh, it takes uh, longer for that entire cheese to come to the same salt content. However, if we compare this, like the, even these big wheels that I have to salt four times, you know, to get enough salt into a, about a six to seven kilo cheese, well, during, it takes a whole week 
to get the, the salt uh, into these cheeses or you know on the rind and being drawn into the cheese. Uh, it's still, the salt diffuses faster to the center of, of a cheese when you're dry salting than it does when you're brining. So, so it also, and it also protects the surface from contaminating molds. So you can benefit from that where, you know, your, your rinds stay cleaner up to the point of needling, your salt diffuses faster if you choose to surface salt versus brining. And finally, we, you know, we have brining, which is the, the, the easiest way really to, uh, to get uh, the cheese salted from the outside. It's less labor intensive, it takes up less room, and so uh, hopefully you all are familiar with brining. Um, and uh, if not, we can do another presentation. Although I did cover that in a presentation on salting last year. So um, just a few more points about brining. Um, some of the whey is released into the brine. Uh, during brining, we would like to get the cheese to cool down a bit before we put it in the brine so that we can prevent too much loss of moisture into the brine. Brining times, it really depends on uh, the thickness of the cheese. And here, blue cheeses, you know, we're, we know they're sort of on, in the middle range of moisture contents and, and, and a great variety of cheeses. So we can use a formula such as this one that I rely on where I go uh, and say, well, I'm gonna, uh, measure how many inches thick the cheese is. I'm going to multiply that by uh, how many pounds it weighs, and that is going to give me the number of hours the cheese is going to be in the brine. So this is just the way I do it. And uh, of course, I'm sure you all have your own opinions and and, and ways that you you do brine. So now for the aging process. Um, here, you know, the blue mold itself is so special in, in what it brings to cheese flavor because of the way the lipases break down um, the fats. And we get these particular uh, um, molecules called methyl ketones that are really have been uh, shown to define the blue cheese flavor. It's like the backbone of the flavor. But we're also going to get the benefit of, of proteases that break down proteins, and we're going to get some sulfur notes, some savory aspects to the flavors in blue. It can be very complex, right? If you throw in the fact you're working with raw milk, even more complex. So I said earlier that, however, if you're using pasteurized milk, you, you can benefit from you know knowing what's going to happen when you you throw in this blue mold. You can you can almost predict. Um, the kind of flavor you're going to get. And so these are the kinds of things you can get from the, the blue cheese, uh, I mean the blue mold manufacturers, so these spider graft type flavor profile uh, um, graphs, yeah, that uh, give you some idea of what the uh, products will produce for flavor. So I encourage you to do some research on that. Just a couple of different ones I'm juxtaposing. This one is a gorgonzola type blue mold, PRG. And then over here we have three types of, of a more standard uh, type blue mold, not designed just for gorgonzola. And finally, uh, we're going to race through the uh, aging process for blue cheese. So uh, we're going to start out with salting, the circuit breaker of, of you know, going from the cheese room to the aging room. And here, when they start to get the cheese salted, we're moving it in a, into a cooler environment, typically. Um, certainly nothing higher than 68 degrees. Mostly it's done up at about cave temperature, cellar temperature, 52 to 55 Fahrenheit. So like 11 to 13 centigrade, and the highest would be maybe 20 centigrade. Um, and that's the early stage. And this is done for, for many, uh, many types, uh, and especially Stilton. Stilton is done in this hastening type room where it's rather warm, about 20 centigrade, and that, that cheese slowly ferments, curds knit a bit better, they're turning them every day, and also gas is forming between the curds to help keep those curds open.
So we come into the second and third weeks and the salt is diffusing well, CO2 is developing. Now it's time to needle the curd. It's time to get some air into the wheels for most all blues. Um, and we want to have a room that's, again, cellar cave temperature, about 11 to 13 centigrade with a high relative humidity. We don't need to have a lot of ventilation. Um, we don't need so much fresh air exchange in the aging room because the, the blue mold itself does not uh, enjoy too much oxygen. So we you know, don't need to have um, too much air, like in the case of a blooming rind cheese, we want to have a good air exchange here we don't have, have to do it so much unless we're making one of those soft grape and blues with the blooming rind. We want to turn the cheese frequently in the beginning so that it, the moisture you know, moves through the cheese evenly and eventually dehydrates out so that it's stable. Um, if we leave it too long on one side, it'll, it'll get too wet and might stick to the shelf. We're going to see blue mold growing on the surface during this time, but because the strains that are used in uh, making the, uh, the interior of the blue, um, they uh, are not, they're, they're micro aer aerophilic. So they're, they're not really enjoying a highly oxygenated environment. Um, and so they're gonna fade as time goes on. And I've seen this every year I've made blue. And that, that leads way to a nice rind. In my case, I've got a cellar that I've, had cheese in for 20 years, and I've got a nice indigenous white mold that seems to cover everything uh, with a thin felt um, once I, I, I back off and say washing the cheese rind. But in the case of the blue, I do nothing to it, and the blue mold fades. Sometimes there, it gets a little uh, reddish or like sticky with some yeast, but that tends to fade off, and then we get the nice white surface forming. And that, that has to do with keeping relative humidity, just right about there, 95%. If it gets too high, then we get more yeasty and stickiness. And if it's uh, too low, we just don't get much of anything. Needling, like I said, would be done right in there, uh, usually at one to two weeks of aging. And in, But in the case of Stilton and Gorgonzola, that's actually, you're waiting six weeks. And that what makes those cheeses so unique is they have a lot of cheese flavor in addition to the zippy, spicy blue mold flavor. They, they have a, a very complex flavor profile because the needling is delayed. And so, you, you know, once you needle a blue, you've got a couple weeks before the, um, the blue mold gets established in there and begins to break down the protein or fat, soften the texture and create flavor. So here's something you can experiment with, um, which is, is the time you would needle. And then finally, um, you know, in the case of a natural rind blue, we're, uh, we're just turning the wheels about once a week. This is our west-west blue here, as it was in the previous picture. And uh, you can see that white mold getting established very well when it becomes an older cheese. Start chilling this cheese at about five to six months. That's when it's nice and creamy inside. And so we can then choose temperatures below about 10 centigrade, even as far down as four centigrade if we want to have a slower aging process. And just to finish off, I've uh, got uh, um, some parameters here that just uh, grab everything together in a nutshell that I just talked about. So I'm just going to leave the presentation here because you guys can have this as a reference and uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. Oops. Folks, took a minute there to get unmuted. Peter, if you could please open up your chat box. There's a question yeah. there waiting for you. Um, yeah. yeah, folks, we put these two pictures here of um, Venus Blue from Prom Country Cheese and Riverine Blue from Berries Creek. Both won um, Australian Grand Dairy Awards last week and um, had the good fortune of tasting them, which was absolutely delicious. So um, Blues really made their mark at the Australian Grand Dairy Awards last week. Alrighty, Great. so Peter, you've really brought home the diversity of blue cheese and um, all the different varieties. Your, okay, um, so should I just start, start in with this? 
Yeah. So if you okay. can please read out the question. I'll read this out to the group. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. All right, from Diane to everyone. Uh, I believe that you can make blue and then at a certain point freeze the immature rounds to then defrost them at a later date to then commence ripening. Can you comment on this? Uh, I would say yes, but you're not going to freeze it. You're going to bring it to the point where it's almost frozen. And I know this because this is the way Gorgonzola is uh, managed. I mean, I'm sorry, Roquefort. Roquefort being a seasonally made cheese would not be available year round if they didn't practically freeze it in a vacuum seal uh, packaging and then st and keep it in you know storage right at that sort of tipping point where it's not it's not frozen but it's so cold that not much is going on and in this way they can right slow down the aging to to almost nothing and then pop it out and and distribute it to keep the blue uh, the um, Roquefort in the pipeline for the marketing. Okay. Um, so you could do that. And you can do that with a lot of cheeses. If you want to do a, a washed drying cheese, you can vacuum seal it at a young age, keep it very cold, and then pop it out and begin to wash the rind and develop it. So here's the next question. Uh, at what stage is the moisture at 43%? Uh, at hooping the next day or final maturation of the cheese? It is at uh, final uh, maturation of the cheese um, in the case of a rindless cheese. So in the case of a, uh, a, a cheese with a natural rind, as I've been focusing on tonight, you can start out at 43, but remember, you need to have that 95% relative humidity to prevent the cheese from losing too much moisture during its aging process. And it will probably end up at about 41 or so by the time of stage. This is also where you're gonna look at the size of the cheese you're making, because if you wanna reach a longer maturation time, have a, you know, uh, like I, in my case, a five, six month aging time before the uh, cheese is mature and ready to sell, I'm making them at six, seven kilos, not, you know, one kilo or two kilos. So it's a combination of, of the size and then the time frame before it's ready for sale. Is, is what you would uh, you would be looking at, but yes, it's it's the uh, the starting moisture uh, uh, on the next day. Okay, so from Paul Shanahan, does the quantity of rennet used in the mixed and rennet cheeses differ? I have not found that to be the case. Uh, I use the same amount, um, and. Uh, in the case of the soft ripened ones with the lactic character, that's where I would, would uh, sometimes be using less so I can get a, uh, a longer coagulation and develop more acidity before I cut the curd. And now from Jennifer, do you recommend a certain type of salt to be used in blue cheese making? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I think um, if you're making a brine, you can use any kind of of, of natural salt, you know, uh, unrefined type salt that doesn't have a, uh, any caking agents and whatnot, uh, uh, certainly not iodine. If you're surface salting, I think you need a bit of a flake salt, so a fine flake to even coarser flake salt uh, is what I would recommend. That helps the salt diffuse uh, less rapidly, so you have salt in contact with the rind for a longer time which again helps to keep the rind more pure and prevent contaminants from growing. Okay, now from Will. Oh wait, from Paul Shanahan. You made an early reference to developing your own starter cultures. What procedure do you use? Well, Paul, we're gonna have to save that for another presentation because I've got a <laughs> whole presentation around that. And uh, if you all find that interesting, I would love to do it for you because I can't do it in a couple minutes. Um, it's essentially uh, preparing the culture from a raw milk. So you would have to be making raw milk cheese in order to use my method of doing it. But there are other ways you can do it if you're using pasteurized milk. So we'll save that for another time. Um, from Will Rogers, I'm trying to create a blue that has bubbles 
holes of blue within it by using propionic cultures like Swiss. Oh, interesting. The blue mold doesn't seem to want to grow inside these bubbles, just on the external surface. Any ideas? Yeah. Okay, so what I think is probably going on, because because with the propionic cultures, if they're growing well in your cheese and making the bubbles, it means that the cheese isn't very acidic, because they are not acid tolerant. So what's what's probably going on is that is is your cheeses aren't acid enough for the blue to be happy. The second thing that could be going on is that is is when you have propionic activity, they're creating these bubbles in a firm paste. So you don't really have that kind of structure with the nooks and crannies that you can that are accessed by when you needle into the cheese itself. So I, I hope that's uh, um, uh, clear. <laughs> but I think that's what's going on. So I would say go to the Leuconostic Cremorous uh, type culture and, and put in a good dose of that to get more gas producing inside the cheese over the first week. And that will help keep the openings between the curds that you need. Wow, this is so exciting, Peter. Um, okay, there aren't any more questions here at the moment, but just while if anyone else is thinking of questions, um, Peter's salting webinar, which was conducted two and a half years ago now, Peter, um, was absolutely oh. outstanding. And the recording of it is going to be uploaded to the Dairy Australia website in the next month or so. Um, Dairy Australia has a really good resource library there of old we older webinars and um, you can refer to that at any time. They're free and um, if we haven't got the recording, the PDF will be there. So welcome to do that. If anyone has any questions within the next week, you're welcome to send them through to me and I'll put you in touch with Peter. That would be really wonderful. So with that, we've now reached our time. Um, Peter, I'd like to thank you very, very much for all that work and effort you've put into this presentation and for doing it late at night so as we were able to get more cheesemakers from Australia attending. With that, um, thank you everyone for attending and keep in mind that um, we are wanting questions for Ian um, Powell's Cultures webinar. Please send those through to me. Thank you. Very